Hi, all. This is an interview with Grant Williams and Kyle Bass of Heyman Capital. Kyle Bass talks about how he goes about sizing positions in a portfolio, as well as some things that he sees on the horizon, some macro imbalances uh, in China, uh, negative bond convexity around the world. That's a problem that was big when this interview was filmed, but it's gotten even bigger. So this is a reason that you know Kyle Bass is one of the Real Vision favorites and why this interview in particular uh, is one of the, the best performing and most viewed interviews on Real Vision. Um, so please enjoy uh, this interview with Kyle Bass and Grant Williams. Uh, watch also the other interviews in the Real Vision archive. And if you like Kyle's work, which you probably do, um, stay tuned for his interview with Steve Clapham, which uh, will come out later this week. They're going to be doing a deep dive on uh, the accounting standards of Chinese tech companies. Thank you. Kyle, thank you so much for having me out to this beautiful slice of Texas countryside. It's great to have it's, you. It's not something that a little guy who grew up in England and lives in Singapore ever gets to see, so, so thank you. A uh, uh, ton of stuff I want to talk to you about, and I, I want to kick off with a couple of things that came into my mind when I watched the piece that you and Raoul did last year when you were talking about portfolio construction and, and stuff. And something that you touched upon was position sizing. Mm -hmm. and. You then very kindly went into John Burbank for us. Mm -hmm. And it really hit me like a ton of bricks. John walks into the room, you shake hands, you sit down, and you say, so John, how do you size your positions? You know, it's the one thing that every smart manager wants to know, is there a better way to do it? Does this guy have a little trick to do it? Can you talk a little bit about the importance of position sizing and just flesh out how you think about that? Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, Raoul and I had a conversation call it two years ago, a private conversation um, about this very subject. Because, um, you know, when you, <clears throat> if you think about the world, whether you're, whether you're micro, uh, whether you're an equity analyst, whether you're a macro investor, um, when you come to a conclusion about something, some situation that you are, you have a high level of conviction that that situation is going to play out and, and the way that you think it's going to play out. Um, I think sizing becomes everything. Yeah. Um, if uh, and a great case in point was with Raoul. You know, we had a uh, we had a Japan fund uh, for the last call it five or so years. And um, in talking with Raoul about two years ago, we got into what a what a full position is and kind of notional value for a for a for a call it G seven or G three currency position. Uh, would be, and you know, when you when you're in the long short world, you know, a five percent position in a long short fund is yeah. is technically a big position, and and there are some managers that are more concentrated that'll do, you know, ten, twenty, and John Burbank and his special fund will do thirty percent positions, which, in reality, uh, is how one really makes, uh, let's say, let's say large amounts of yeah. of money or high or high returns. Um, and, and I respect um, those people that have the courage of their convictions a lot more than those uh, who eke out eight to ten percent gains a year by having forty positions and having very little right conviction in each position. So when I think about sizing, you know, uh, to your point, when I met with John or when I meet with anyone, I say, okay, how do you yeah. size this? How do you think about the risk? Um, and um, from my perspective. Um, if you're if you're talking about uh, a subprime bond trading at par, you know all you're thinking about is negative carry. So when someone says you're 100 percent positioned um, in a subprime, hi, I'm Ralph Powell. Sorry to interrupt your video. I know it's a pain in the ass, but look, I want to tell you something important. Is I can tell that you really want to learn about what's going on in financial markets and understand the global economy in these complicated times. That's what we do at Real Vision. So this YouTube channel is a small fraction of what we actually do. You should really come over to realvision.com and see the 20 or so videos a week that we produce of this kind of quality of content, the deep analysis and understanding of the world around us. So if you click on the link below or go to realvision.com, it costs you $1. I don't think you can afford to be without it. Bon, you say, yes, but I'm really only risking 2% yeah. um, a year. Um, to maintain this position, and that's those are two different things, right? Sure. So you have to be able to think in in different paradigms, uh, in different asset classes, uh, 
And so when you get into the macro world where I know uh, you are, Grant, and myself, um, we think about sizing things properly, whether it's a pegged currency or whether it's a free floating currency, what uh, we don't think about anything in, in VAR terms and value no. at risk terms. I think about how far they've moved in the past uh, and how far it can move against me. Uh, that's the first thing I think about is how far can it move against me yeah. um, before, and that's, that's how we think about sizing things. And then we look at correlations between different positions. If you're gonna have five or six, you need to know how correlated they're yeah. going to be. But you, you, you bring up conviction in there, which is, which is such an important thing. And it's really hard. People get scared out of convictions by having a couple go against them. You know, guys that get things right, you can get things right for five or six years, you get that one wrong and suddenly your, your belief system is shaken. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you maintain that conviction? Is it just a constant checking and rechecking your thesis? You know, something like Japan is the perfect example. It's because you know, your rational investor paradox, when I first heard that, I'm just sitting there going tick, tick, tick. Okay, that's flawless logic. And it remains flawless logic to this day. And I know that you get people questioning about this stuff all the time. Yeah. And I'm sure that those questions stem from the fact that it, that it is such an open and shut case. And there's this confusion amongst people who watch this stuff that if something hasn't happened, it didn't happen. How do you maintain that, that belief in that, that full circle when for reasons unbeknownst to any of us really, this thing that really will play out hasn't played out yet? Mm, it's a great question. Now, there are two, there are kind of two subsets of questions within that one and one. One is, uh, so I'll answer your question first, but then I'm going to get into something that's even larger, I think. And the question that you ask is, you know, I, I recently made a comment that, that kind of made its, made its uh, way around the world. I said, it's, it's easy to maintain a conviction. It's harder to maintain investors. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, the, it, to those that are committed to the excellence of research in this business uh, and ideas in this business, uh, we check and recheck our thesis all the time. It's a constant endeavor, 24-7, um, uh, seven days a week. Um, in being more public with, with your views also invites a new level of scrutiny and, and, uh, scrutiny and discourse. And that discourse only makes you better at what you do. People say, well, why, why were you public about you know, this view? And I say, well, there's always a reason and it's never the reason you think it is. Um, you know, the, the lay person would think that, you know, I love doing something publicly and being in the public eye, and I don't. Um, I love the discourse that it brings. I love the finance minister from country XYZ calling me and saying, I'd like to share notes with you. I'd like to talk to you about that thesis. I like the professor that studied this his entire life to come talk to me about how he thinks I'm wrong or how he uh, basically poking holes in, in thesis or even adding to my, to my basic view. Those conversations are priceless. Uh, and the only way you get there is by willing to engage publicly uh, with your views. So I, I think that maintaining that conviction, um, again, has many different subsets, but it's all, it is all constant discourse uh, and not surrounding yourselves with yes people, yeah. surrounding yourselves with people um, um, that are more um, objective in their analysis and um, if you can show me logically and objectively how I'm wrong, I will change my opinion. Right. And I think the people in our business that, that refuse to be objective um, end up, um, I think, get, you know, losing a lot of money uh, and a lot of investors. Um, the second part of the answer I'd love to give you is, you, know, you, 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 you mentioned that, that we, we engage with a lot of extremely smart people and extremely wealthy people. Uh, and we're engaged in this global game of investing. And the game, I would, I would be willing to submit to you that this game was a lot easier, um, more, let's say 10 years ago and prior, than it's been in the last 10 years, ever since the global financial crisis. And what I mean by that is, you have a logical, plausible, as you put it, flawless argument. I don't think there are any flawless arguments, but <laughs> let's say almost flawless right. um, from, a, from just a pen and paper perspective, um, like Japan's debt situation, right? We all know that they will never be able to repay 1.1 quadrillion yen of debt 
um, given a shrinking population and everything that Japan has going for it, absent, of course, some exogenous event where they invent cold fusion or something that they could change the world with technologically that, that could pay off their debts. But in a, in a, uh, in a let's just say, a, 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 a normalized economic scenario uh, would tell you that they can't repay their debts. However, uh, we have this paradigm that we entered, I think, back during the global financial crisis where the world's central banks uh, and monetary policy has been the answer to all ills. Um, and uh, as educated investors, you and I and, and the hedge fund community, uh, as, as educated as we are, um, you have to sometimes throw logical economic analysis right out the window. And if you're fighting the central banks uh, for too long, uh, your, your investors will leave. And so the interesting thing, the interesting thing about what we do today uh, is you have to handicap the central banks a lot. Well, in every decision you make, essentially. In every decision you make. And that actually makes it not very fun. No. Uh, it doesn't and, make... And impossible. It, it's intellectually dishonest yeah. um, to a certain extent. And so one sees the people that are... You know, you look at, you look at, the, at the CalPERS of the world and you look at the insurance companies with AIG recently saying, you know what? Hedge fund performance is terrible, kind of across the board, we're redeeming our whole portfolio. Well, that's number one, it's been true. Um, but number two, is that the right thing to do? Maybe they're doing the right thing at the wrong time. Yeah. Um, right thing meaning looking in the rearview mirror saying hedge funds aren't doing well because um, so far all you've needed to do was give your money to Draghi, Triche, and Kuroda san and the rest of them and just go to the beach right? Or Draghi, I said Triche, Draghi. Uh, you know, the, the world's central bank and uh, 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 heads have, have been basically moving all asset prices up. What we're coming into now, and something you and I discussed off camera, was the world seems to be um, um, starting to question yeah. uh, the efficacy of additional monetary policy. And we saw it in Japan in January. Um, and we're starting to hear some of the biggest investors in the world. You know, what I see, it looks like they're talking Ricardian equivalents in their views, even though they don't say that. Right. Um, they're saying that um, kind of uh, subconsciously or subliminally in their views. You're seeing uh, Ricardian equivalents come play here. And so I, I think we're starting to hear about helicopter money. And again, that's, a, that's the, you know, call it unsterilized intervention, right? Well, this, I mean, it's, it's such a great point. I, and I listen to these guys very, very carefully. And I, I, I'm not so focused on the message all the time as just the sense of where the shifts are occurring. Mm. And we've seen Icahn and Zell and Druckenmiller, these guys coming up, which they did in 07. They, they got very vocal right before this thing went down. They're getting very vocal again now. And it's just that shift in perception. And when you talk about this handicap in the central banks, which we've all had to do, and it's essentially impossible. How do, how do a group of free market capitalists handicap a group of academics? We, we speak different languages. So as we watch this thing move forwards, the guys in the markets assume to a cliff somewhere out yonder in the fog. Mm. What do you think tips this thing over? Because to me, it's purely confidence now. It's, it's nothing, there's mm. nothing left but confidence in these guys that they can do this. And you bring up the reaction to Kuroda saying going negative in January. And I think the instant reaction of the markets, people are going to look back on that when the Nikkei fell a thousand points and the yen strengthened by a full bit. That to me was the start of people going, you know, maybe these mm -hmm. guys are just throwing things at the wall. You're right. That was the first time I've seen investors um, show a disbelief yeah. um, in the markets in central banks. And um, I agree with you. That was, uh, that was a watershed moment um, in our business and in, in attempting to see when there's a tectonic shift in the belief systems because um, we all know that, that one of the central banks, you know, uh, objectives is price stability, whatever that means. Right. Um, I think that means each relevant indice that they oversee trading higher yes. and not lower <laughs> right. it equals price stability. Uh, and they didn't get it, Kordasan didn't get it then. And uh, since then, Japan struggled. 
and um, this this concept of Ricardian equivalence, where um, you're issuing debt um, to quantitatively ease on the monetary policy side, and maybe even allowing right, the fiscal authorities to continue to spend, um, comes into comes into play where people just start saving more. And this idea of negative yep. interest rates, realize it, it's interesting. Academically, I can, negative interest rates look like they work on paper. And in reality, what, what these central bank heads are, are realizing, whether you're in Denmark or in Japan or any of these economies, is savers think, well, I just need to save more if I'm not going to earn anything on my savings. Um, so the, the psychological handicapping is proving to be difficult for even the central bank heads. Um, and I think, you know, in the end, and I don't know when the end is, but in the end, uh, we're going to see unsterilized intervention. We're going to yeah. see helicopter money. You know, Bernanke's been running around behind the scenes talking about setting up a $100 billion fund uh, for Congress to distribute to fiscal spending that's not, uh, um, that's not part of a debt issuance plan, just a, a, a basically a Fed printed plan. Um, so we're already crossing the Rubicon of, of the helicopter money. And Japan's talking about... Um, a negative lending facility from the BOJ to the banks. So we're, we're starting to see the, ac the academics will never turn and say we were wrong, right? The, the academics will go more and they'll just go unsterilized. And in the end, we know where that gets all of us. Yeah, but, but it's, it's so bizarre to, that you kind of sit here, anyone with a knowledge of history, as you said, can see where this is going because we've mm. been here so many times before, it just hasn't happened in our lifetime, so people will have a short-term memory for it. That's right. But this idea of helicopter money and the idea of banning cash and all these things that when you sit here in the cold light day, you can see exactly why they need to do these things. Yes. You watch the narrative unfold in the media and then the trial balloons get floated. But you're right, they have to go to helicopter money. They're, they're really not going to have a choice. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that they are going to have to try and ban cash because as you say, this, the, the U.S. savings rate has tripled since 2007, mm -hmm. and that's the, literally the last thing they want or need. So is there any way out for these guys? Because that's the thesis that I keep checking. Mm. I can't see a way out ab absent cold fusion. Look, I had, a, I, had a, I had a fascinating kind of out-of-body experience meeting with one of the world's top central bankers in a private meeting um, about three years ago, and he said, you know, Kyle, quantitative easing only works when you're the only country doing it. Right. Um, now, he would never say that publicly. Sure. Right. And I'll, I'll protect his name uh, because it was a private meeting. But it was one of those moments where I, it was one of those uh, epiphanies almost where it's something you and I knew. Yeah. But hearing him say it, call it one of the four top central bankers in the world, um, was, was a, it, was a, it was a jarring experience for me. Because when I look around the world today, everyone's in the same boat, um, you know. Uh, so it, we're all trying, we're attempting through our treasury and our Fed to get the rest of the world to not devalue against us, um, while we quietly attempt to devalue ourselves against them. And it's all this, uh, it's, it is the race to the bottom. It is the beggar than neighbor policies that we all talk about. And I believe that there, there isn't a way out. Um, but, uh, you know, going from um, a problem of recording equivalents to helicopter money is like a natural, yeah. logical step for them. I'm glad I'm not them. Uh, but as a, as a global participant and more importantly, as a global citizen, um, you know how to allocate your assets yeah. in that scenario. And, and um, um, you need to own productive assets to try to defend yourselves from this. So, so that, that kind of segues into, when we talk about the currencies, into the dollar, which is something that there's been so much discussion about in the last you know, 18 months. Mm. And there's the stronger forever camp. You know, and Rao's made a fantastic case as to why he thinks the dollar could go another 20, 30% from here even. Mm. And he's been right for a year and a half. And then there are the guys who say, it's topping out, it's days done, and we're, we're seeing the end of it right now. Where do you stand on that? I would lean towards Rao's camp there, but I, I'd rather answer the question more specifically. And what I mean by that is, right, you, the dollar versus what? Sure, uh, sure. Right? And I spent a lot of time on China, and um, the, the credit growth in China 
you know, again, being 1100% in 10 years with GDP growth at 500. And now we're to kind of, we need seven credit units for one unit of GDP. We're at the atrophy level uh, in China. So when we think about whether it's dollar uh, renminbi um, or dollar yuan or however, however you want to say it, um, I think about the fact that whether, whether Yellen's going from hawkish to dovish or dovish to hawkish, uh, depends on which day it is, um, that is marginally important for the traders in the marketplace today. But what's going to just absolutely overcome the U.S. position uh, is how many bad loans China's made. Uh, and that will, that will literally um, overwhelm uh, U.S. monetary policy. And I think, that, um, I think that the U.S. has really nowhere to go. I think the Fed, we've been in an emergency level of, of accommodative monetary policy for over seven and a half years. Yeah. And uh, we're at four and a half percent unemployment, right? I mean, um, and wages are moving. And if oil stays around 50, we're going to have integers in front of our CPI in the, in the fourth quarter, right, on a run rate. So the U.S. is in a position where um, we should have raised long ago. We should have tried to get away from the zero lower bound. But in Bernanke's famous helicopter speech, um, I've reread that a few times. Yeah, me too. Um, he says... You should never get to the zero lower bound. And if you do, you should get away from it as quickly as possible. Um, well, he didn't do that. And here we're, we're stuck. And I think, um, I think the, I, the answer, again, long answer to your question is they're going to have to do some incremental uh, helicopter money uh, injections. And that's not going to work either. We all know this, right? It, the central banks will get to, they can get to inflation. I'm certain of that. Yeah but it's not going to be the good kind of inflation, right? It's going to be a cost push and not a demand pull. Um, and that isn't good. You know, call it a stagflationary environment. It's not great. Um, and I think it feels to me like globally, that's where we're headed. Although what's going to happen first before that happens globally, in my opinion, is you're going to see China have its um, comeuppance and it's going to have um, a non-forming loan cycle in its banks. And we're starting to see um, signs of China's system coming to a, a halt on the credit side. So I think when you ask me the question about dollar forever up or down, I think, I think about it more in the medium term. In the medium term, it's going to be dollar much higher versus the Asian currencies. Mm -hmm. China's a, a, something else that you've been very vocal about recently. You and this, this gang of nefarious Texas hedge fund managers who are trying to take down the People's Bank of China. Um, and again, it's another, in, in, in my reckoning, very well argued case for the devaluation of, of the yuan. And, mm. and, you know, Hugh Hendry was on talking around, said, it'll never happen. The world's over if it happens. And I, I can see where he's coming from. But it seems to me that the, the people that debate on the they won't devalue side are assuming it's going to be a voluntary devaluation, something that they choose to do it's rather a, than they have point. to do. Perfect point. Perfect point. Because that, that seems to me they're going to have to do it to recap the banks. There's going to be a reason for them to do it, not a choice. Well, it's going to happen to them. Yeah, Again, exactly. Uh, even, even, in your, even, even in your soliloquy there, you say they're going to have to do it. Yeah. Um, they're going to have to allow it to happen. It's going to happen, right? Um, I love Hugh. We've had a number of debates um, throughout history, and he's, he is a, he's a fantastic, fantastic individual and, and a br brilliant mind. Um, but if, if the reason that it's not going to happen is because it can't happen because the rest of the world's going to have so much trouble with it, um, that doesn't give me, uh, any, uh, that doesn't give me any, any solace whatsoever. In fact, you, you look back to the U S financial crisis when, um, I would go meet with various heads of investment banks or, um, or investors. And I would say, this is what's going to happen. And this is why, and this is how the structures are structured. And, you know, someone look at me and say, well, that means Fannie and Freddie will be out of business. Right. And so therefore, the government will never let that happen. I say, well, the government doesn't have a choice here. It's too late, right? The, the credit excesses had already been built. Uh, and in China, the credit excesses are already built. Yeah. Right? They've got, we can go into numbers, but like they have asset liability mismatches in their system uh, in wealth management products that are more than 10% of their system. And our asset liability mismatches were two and a half percent of our system, and you know what they did? Sure. So it's a their excesses are already uh, they're already so far 
ahead of the world's excesses in prior crises, that it, it, we're facing the, the largest macro imbalance in world history. And, and to this day, I can't figure out why people um, don't see it for what it is. Well, you know, I, have, I have a theory about that. I, I, th I think, A, they get a pass because there's just enough opacity that you can suspend your belief system. Because mm. let's face it, it suits everybody to think that China's going to be okay. It's, yeah. it's just too frightening to think it'll happen. Mm. And, and the other side is that because these guys are untested, people think, well, you know, maybe they can stick the landing. Maybe they can. To me, it's the most ridiculous argument of all. I mean, you know, first generation capitalists trying to stick a landing that the West has been trying to do unsuccessfully every single time throughout history. Mm. But is the, the idea of China melting down just too horrific for people to take seriously and take any action about? Is mm. that what stops people acting on it? Yeah, I think the behavioral psychology plays a huge part, yeah. and you, you've hit it right on, on the head. Um, I'll give you an interesting anecdote. Again, back, back to the US subprime crisis. Um, I went all over the country um, raising money for a subprime, you know, two subprime funds and some advisor relationships. And it, what was absolutely hilarious to me, looking back at the meetings that we had, is we would go to um, Chicago and we would say, we'd lay out the thesis and they would say, you're exactly right. This is absolutely going to happen. It's not going to happen here in Chicago because of one, two, three, and four, these points. Um, uh, but that's because they live there, right? right. The, the NIMBY, the not in my backyard scenario or psychological uh, um, um, a, a profile of, of events w was not going to happen. But it was going to happen to everyone else but them. Right. And then I'd go to Seattle and I'd lay the thesis out and they'd say, oh, you're absolutely right. It's never going to happen here because Microsoft's here and Amazon's here and then, and, but our houses are fine, but everybody else's homes, they're going to drop 35% and we're going to invest with you. And then I'd go to Southern California and I'd go to Texas and everywhere I went, not one, not one organization or group of investors would agree that it would happen to them, but it was going to happen to everyone else. Um, and that's, that's again, I think the beginning of, of what you and I were just discussing with regard to the psychological uh, profile, or more importantly, the behavioral psychology that plays into one's thought process. Um, because the first thing, I think the first inalienable right of human nature is self-preservation. Um, and when you get into a thought of, okay, a huge position is if, it hap if, it, if this were to happen, it would be so globally terrible that therefore they're going to not let this happen. Um, that's just, again, I think I understand that logic, and I think you do too, but I believe it's flawed. And the reason it's flawed uh, is, again, it's just this, this it's almost like the um, uh, Kahneman's availability heuristic, where you, you only have this certain data set, sure. and you only look at history back. I think the brevity of financial memory is only about three years. Yeah, if that even. If, if that. Um, and so it, if you believe, if you, if you end up believing that this happens, then you think about, well, that's bad for my portfolio my investment, my job, therefore my family, and therefore the environment that surrounds my family. And I don't want to even believe that can, that can be a possibility because all that scenario of chain reactions would be too bad for everyone, and including myself. Someone said to me years ago, said, you know, don't bet on Armageddon because it only ever happens once. And that mindset, that's kind of stuck with me for a long time, and that mindset is prevalent everywhere you look. And, and it's interesting, when you talk about this, the, the central banker saying, QE only works when one of you does it. This has been my argument about Japan for years. People say, mm. well, the Japanese have done this for 20 years, so it's fine. But they were doing it in a vacuum for the first 15 of those. And so the world, even though it was the second biggest economy, the world could carry Japan doing that because there was growth elsewhere. There was, there was stuff going on that meant, you know, if Japan is screwed and they're printing money and going crazy, there is, the, the slack's getting picked up. Now, of course, there is no slack, and China may just be the last guy on top of the dog pile that crushes the person at the bottom. Yeah, and I, and I just don't see how people can err on the side of assuming China is going to be okay because the quantum, if it isn't, mm. you you can't you can't put the trades on once that goes wrong. That's right. You you have to be there beforehand. Yeah, um, I think uh, to enjoy the asymmetry, various asymmetries. But you know, I again, 
this is we're kind of jumping all over the place, but it's important to do so. Yeah. Um, when you look at the difference between China and Japan, and one were to really when you when you look one layer beneath, you look at the organizational structure of China, where you have you have the the Communist Party uh, that Xi runs and the Standing Committee, the Politburo. There's seven members. Then there's 25 members of the Politburo. The Communist Party determines how China's run. And then uh, they tell Li Keqiang, who runs the, the government side, uh, how to implement the policies of the Communist Party. When you look at the standing committee, um, there's one guy in the standing committee that I think is the most relevant guy under Xi, and it's, it's Wang Kishan. And um, he went to high school with Xi. He's, um, he's his anti-corruption minister. And that standing committee, as you know, kind of has dinner twice a week. And they, they run the country. Those seven people run China. Uh, it's not the 25 in the Politburo or anyone on the government side, for that matter. Um, and when you hear Wang's views on um, what happened, what went wrong with Japan, uh, and I don't know, I think very few people know this, but Wang has said uh, that he thinks Japan's, call it critical error, was agreeing to the Plaza Accord. Right. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. He basically said that Japan decided to be submissive to the United States yet once again, um, to sacrifice their economic growth or uh, resurgence for that of the United States because the United States wanted those countries to enter into the Plaza Accord, primarily Japan. Uh, and, and we all know what that was, was basically agreeing not to devalue their currency against the U.S. dollar, and if that is uh, the number one, call it the number two person in China's personal view, that Japan should have never entered the Plaza Accord. How does one think China is going to react it's a great going sign forward? Post. Yeah, right. What they're going to do is they're going to do what's best for China, and what's best for China is to materially devalue their currency. And what's fascinating to me, Grant, is outside of Hugh Hendry, behind the scenes when you talk with some of the largest asset managers in the world and the largest investors in the world, and you lay out a 100-page PowerPoint of, of exactly how their banking system and credit system works and how, they're, how they are kind of putting off the, the final day of just realizing a loss cycle. You, you mentioned Armageddon. It's not Armageddon. They're going to have a loss cycle. They'll recap their banks. Their currency will depreciate. Uh, pretty materially. It will export deflation to the world one last time. And if you have any money left, it will be the best time in the world to invest. And we both know this. It's 1982 all over again. Right? It's, it'll be the greatest time ever uh, to invest in Asia. But you have to have this cycle that no one believes is going to happen. Well, actually, let me rephrase that. That almost everyone I talk to believes is going to happen. No one knows when. Yeah. It's now gone from, it's not going to happen to, it's a foregone conclusion, but we don't know about the timing. Right. And so um, I think it's now based upon the timing uh, as to when it's going to happen. And it sure feels like it's it's happening as we speak. How do you handle that? Because you, you look at that and, and as I say we, I'm, I'm kind of flip about it. But this this narrative about these evil Texas hedge fund managers, I mean, it's so farcical to me. But how do you when you look at this and you think, OK, you know what? Because you, you went through 06, 07 and you pressed the gas at the right time because mm -hmm. you had that conviction. You felt, OK, it's happening and yeah. I'm going to do something about it. How do, you, how do you reflect that thinking uh, in terms of China as opposed to your own domestic mortgage market, which is so much more transparent at the time and easier mm. to get a position on? You know, in China, it's, it's more transparent than you think it is. Um, there, are, there are really, there's an, interest, there's, there's, there's an interesting set of databases and numbers. There are, there's a pretty interesting level of granularity in Chinese bank annual reports. Um, that you can see, you can actually see in the footnotes to the bank annual reports kind of how big the shadow finance system is and how fast WMPs are growing, the wealth management product business is growing. Um, and so it, it actually is more data, uh, there's a plethora of data that I just think people don't take the time to look through. Right. What's been fascinating to me, so is, again, I'll answer this in two, two ways. In, in studying China for the last two years, um, what's fascinating to us as a firm has been when we talk to the sell side uh, that, that has been covering, call it Chinese equities or 
China macro, um, the lack of in-depth analysis that goes on and just um, using blanket comments and opinions that, that are not substantiated whatsoever by fact, uh, it's all uh, supposition and innuendo, is fascinating to me. It's the world's second largest economy and, and very few people know anything about it. Um, they just trust in the fact that it's going to continue to grow at uh, seven or eight percent a year and be the engine for growth growth in the globe. So that that's one interesting phenomenon that that I actually am embarrassed uh, for the rest of the the call it the sell side that covers China. They're getting they're getting better. They're coming up the curve now, but it's interesting that as of a year ago, very few people were up that curve. Um, and then I can't remember where I was going to go with the second thing, but but uh, I think that that's really fascinating to me to really dive into a system and spend a lot of time on credit. Oh, you, you were asking about pressing the gas. Um, look, there's some things happening. Part of this is like maintaining my own intellectual property, so right. so no, I have sure, to be sure, sure. I have to be somewhat uh, you know guarded in my answer. But let's say there are so many perfect parallels to. It doesn't matter whether it's the U.S. mortgage credit system or whether it's the European banking system or the Chinese banking system. It, there are things that go on in those systems that show you that there are problems. And the plumbing of those systems is key, right, to, to kind of keeping it running uh, in, a very smooth, um, in a very smooth and efficient way, almost a well-oiled machine. Uh, you know where the machine breaks down. And we're starting to see the beginning of the Chinese machine literally break down. And I'll, I'll, I'll cover one of those things with you now. You know, there was, a, the, there was one default in 2014, all right? There were, they were um, 19 um, last year, uh, or yeah, 19 last year. And so far to date, uh, we've already seen, sorry, sorry, no, there were 15 last year. There have been 19 so far this year. Uh, and almost and right at half of the defaults have been standard enterprises this year. So what's happening? The Chinese corporate bond market uh, is freezing up. Uh, since April 11th, the Chinese corporate bond markets had 150 cancellations out of about 210 announced deals. Well, why is that relevant? Well, you can do your own uh, math with how many corporate bonds are put into asset liability mismatch products that the banks sell to individuals. Well, if those bonds get halted or restructured and there's a debt for equity swap, how do you put equity into something that's levered four to 10 times sure. where someone's trying to make a yield, uh, an individual investor is trying to make a yield? So there's a, there's a fascinating series of events that are, that are happening that it's clear as day how it's going to gum up and it's beginning to stop. And so um, you know, one has to develop their own opinion as to how it's going to happen and how that will metastasize or begin to really play things out. And um, we see it starting now. So do, do you, I mean, when you, when you look back on 06, do you, is that some kind of loose template for you? Are you looking for certain signposts along the way? Or does the fact that it is China and you do have this X factor of, well, they may not handle this the same way a Western democracy would handle it. There's always that what if they oh yeah so so no i game theory is is right is yeah. is, is is call it the, the most important thing uh when you're investing like we are sure uh and so when i think about there is no loose template there is there's a basic understanding of a credit system that happens whether you're a socialist slash communist system um or whether you're a western capitalist um those credit systems work Similarly, believe it or not, right? When you start yeah. bringing interbank leverage into the equation and you start uh, bringing asset liability mismatches in, they're the, even though they're Chinese and even though they're selling them to Chinese investors, they work just like asset-backed commercial paper conduits in the U.S. The different investor constituency, different laws governing these things. But in the end, how does that system work? How has it grown? And again, who are the decision makers? And again, when you think about this is one of the, I think, misconceptions that people have over China. Xi Jinping doesn't make every decision as to which SOE gets paid and which one doesn't. It does, he doesn't make any decision as to which SOE pays its bills and which um, investor is going to be paid 100 cents on the dollar or 80 cents on the dollar or 20 cents on the dollar for a restructured bond. Um, they're all, the 31 provinces all have their own economic 
uh, decisions to make, and those are driven by the top, but there's no one central decision maker, and we're seeing that play out in the defaults that we've seen to date. And I think the world seems to think that they flip a switch and everything's gonna work that way. And what's interesting is the politics of the system tells you it doesn't work that way. Um, and so how it plays out is actually very similar to how it played out in the US. Look, President Bush didn't want the last year of his eight year uh, tenure to include the global financial crisis. Sure. And clearly none of us wanted Fannie or Freddie uh, to be put into a receivership or a, a conservatorship, whatever they call uh, what they did. Um, and one would think that if housing prices went down and these products uh, did so poorly that it'd bring down the banking system, therefore it couldn't happen. I heard that argument in 2006. Yeah. I heard it many times, can't happen because the consequences would be so dire that something can't happen. And when I look at what's happening now in China, the amplitude of what's, what's happening is two, three, four times what it was in the US, to your point, to rookies. They've only, you know, the, the people running the Chinese regulatory and oversight uh, for their system have only been doing this for less than 20 years. Uh, and they've really never endured a full crisis. I guess back in the Asian financial crisis, um, in 98, 99, and the Chinese banking recap of 01, um, that still cost them 30% of GDP, right? This one's gonna cost them about 30% of GDP. Loss given defaults, we think will be more than 80%. Uh, percent. They're gonna lose $3 trillion of bank capital, right? That's what we believe at our firm. Um, they only have $2 trillion of capital in there, so the parallels are actually eerily similar. The um, imbalances are much larger in China, right? Things have been so pro-cyclical so aggressively for so long that when you have a turn, the turn's going to be a little harder. But as a, I've answered your question a very long way, how they deal with this, it's not Armageddon. They're going to recap their banks. Right. They're going to expand the PBOC's balance sheet. They're going to slash the reserve requirement. They're gonna drop the deposit rate to zero. They're gonna do everything the US did in our crisis. They're gonna, there is a playbook, there's a template for them. Yeah. They have to do what they have to do. Every single thing the Chinese central bank and central planners have to do is currency negative for them. Yeah, exactly. And it's funny, Everything. You know, when you sit and talk to someone like you who was, who had the viewpoint that you had going into the subprime crisis, and you were very much in the minority because the majority were, this, it can't happen. Mm. It's interesting, I think that makes it so much easier for you to, to embrace the idea of what could happen in China. Because mm. again, most people on the outside, it's, it's too big to fail. If anything is too big to fail in people's minds, it's right. China. Right. And so I think having that unique experience of battling the world, checking your convictions, being utterly short, and then having that one magical day when it's happening. Mm. People really have a problem doing that because it's, it's such a hard thing to get your head around. Yeah, I think also, you know, when you look at, when I look at short sellers, whether they're equity, most short sellers are known as equity short yeah. sellers, right? Uh, people that, that keep the world in check and balance. The majority of those people are, some of them are good friends of mine, uh, but it, it, you become, one becomes depressed, right? Those people, and sometimes are, are, are manic depressed manically depressed and it's because it it's because of of your the point you just made or due to the point that you just made that for 99 percent of the time things aren't working well yeah. for them and there's that half of one percent of the time in which they get it right and and it is euphoric when you get it right um but that's a that's a that's a it's a high price to pay and it's a long road uh, to, to, to run down and maintain confidence, maintain investors. Um, I'm not looking for global imbalances on the short side all the time. In fact, right. one of our big, biggest successes in the last few years was being long Argentinian yep. debt. Um, I would much rather be on the side of um, more of the crowd thinking that things are going to get better and be optimistic and work out. I'm optimistic about this scenario, even though in the near term, we're going to see it turned down and they're gonna to have to recap their banks and things are gonna be bad. Once that happens, it makes me feel so much better about the world to invest in it. Yeah. 
Um, so I'm not someone that is a perma bear, and I think you know that. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and I know there are perma bears on China, uh, but from my perspective, it's just a scenario that I see has come to a head. And one other point that you made, um, one of my good friends, uh, Dan Loeb, says all the time to me that that um, there are no short sellers on the Forbes 400 list, so be careful. <laughs> right. And and a friend, to you, friend, I think told you don't don't invest in Armageddon. You know, it only happens right. once in a blue moon. All of those things are absolutely true. But to check caution to the wind and hope the central banks get it right from here, um, I think is an outsized risky proposition. I, I, I couldn't agree more. It'd be, it's, it'd be, it would be a breach of anyone's fiduciary duty to do so. Um, so from my perspective, I think um, deciding whether to hedge your portfolio, given the scenario we're discussing, uh, is, is something that one should do. That's absolutely someone should do that um and then that the second question you have to answer is should you go on offense and um i've made the decision to hedge and go on offense yeah that, i think that's the key and that's the thing that's hard for people to, i i interviewed a guy i know you know shad Rowe mm. last week and you know shad was a very successful short seller yes who basically said you know what i'm, I'm just sick of being miserable all the time I, I i'm i'm an optimistic guy yeah i'm trying to make a living out of finding the things that are wrong I just don't want to do that anymore. Yeah. And he's made a very successful switch, which is a hard thing to do, to being a long only one decision guy. He, yes. he buys his stocks and he keeps them. And, and I think when, I, when you and I talk, not today, but in other times we've talked, I'm always struck by what a positive guy you are and what a, what a positive outlook you have on things. Mm. Setting Japan's problems aside and setting China's problems aside. And I think that's human nature. It I is. I think we are optimistic people. Mm -hmm. But, but whenever you talk about the bearish outcomes, which, I mean, let's face it, they're the things you need to talk about because we can all make money buy and hold if markets are going the right way. It's That's easy. right. Um, and we've had a lot of people email us at Real Vision and say, you know, can you go and find some bulls? We want to hear some bulls. And I always write back to these guys and say, look, we're not looking for bears. We're looking for smart. Mm -hmm. And we're finding smart everywhere. And they happen short term to be bearish about certain situations. And that is so crucial to understand. It's valuable. It's, it's incredibly valuable. Yeah. So when you, when you talk to other hedge fund managers who you know, we've seen the performance has been horrible in that part of the world, there's a lot of smart guys who are getting hurt right now. And of course, the media piles on this and you know, we're, we're back to these evil hedge fund managers. Mm. What's the feeling amongst that community? What, what's the sense you get? Is it, is it, okay, this is a real problem or something's going to happen and we're going to be back in the game again. Yeah, I, I, you know, I wish it was uh, the latter, uh, but it, it is the former. It's, um, look, you know, we've had two years of, of, of terrible performance um, and uh, one was just ha making an energy bet a little too soon last year and this year um, fighting the Chinese government so far. Um, you know, and, and I say fighting the Chinese government, Chinese government, in my opinion, wants a deval. Yeah. Uh, they just want to do it on their terms. They don't want to do it on my terms or your terms or the market's terms. They definitely don't want that to happen. Um, so anyway, um, I think the hedge fund community um, is, is worried because the biggest investors in the world are saying, listen, we've tried with you guys and you're just not doing very well. And What's funny about that is, right, all assets have moved up and to the right, uh, and they just think it's going to be easy to have a portfolio of, uh, of bonds and stocks. Now, you and I both know bond yields are at zero, and uh, it's going to be really tough going forward to make, call it, 5% real returns, um, given the structure of global markets today with the debts that exist in the world. But I think the hedge fund managers that I know, that I talk to, um, every day, um, they're still optimistic about life. You have to be optimistic about life. You have to get out of bed every day and be optimistic. And you know, um, John Burbank uh, is a is a great friend, and he he I think he puts it well. And and it's something that I that I love. You know, you you want to be long human innovation and short, uh, as I put it, financial innovation. Uh, you know, so being in San Francisco and in the in the center of Silicon Valley and seeing these. Um, these young people coming up with these tremendous ideas um, that are that are revolutionizing the way we all live and invest and work. Um, 
I think it's a great plan. And uh, embracing the plan of, of optimism and innovation on one side and spotting the risks in the world uh, structures on the other side, I think that's a great way to orient your life. Um, there's some duration mismatches in there that you have to deal with. Um, and getting the timing right is key on the short side. Shad Rowe is a, is a great example of someone who was a short seller his whole life and finally was like, you know what, I'm tired of trying to make 10% when I can lose 100 right. or more, right. right? Unlimited losses in theory. Um, I'm tired of doing that. I'm tired of being negative. I just want to be optimistic. And, and um, everyone gets to that point in, in their life. And I believe that, you know, spotting structural anomalies, like whether it's Japan or China or, or something like that, it should just be an arrow in your quiver. It shouldn't be your whole quiver. Right. Um, and in this case, uh, it's the world's second largest economy. So you better be focused on it because in the next two years, this is happening. And if you want to pretend that it's not going to happen, you're going to do poorly somewhere in your portfolio in your life. Uh, but if you accept the fact that it's going to happen, you should just be thoughtful about how to structure your, your portfolio around that. Well, so something else that, that, again, a lot of smart people have suddenly started talking about since the turn of the, of the year and also plays back into this China thesis is gold. It's something that I know mm. you've looked at on and off in the past. Stan Druckmann said it's his biggest currency position. He was very pointed about that when he, when he said that a couple of weeks ago. How, what percentage of his portfolio is it? Uh, I think it was in the 30% range. Okay. I, don't quote me on that. I, that okay. That's the number that's rattling around in the inner recesses of the, my hollow head. But, but a lot of people have started, the technical setup looks good. The chartists all love it. Mm. The Druckmann of the world are saying, get out of markets. I mean, that's a big call for someone like Stan to make. The Chinese we know are buying gold. The Shanghai exchange is delivering 52 times the amount of physical that the COMEX is. What's your current thinking on gold? Because I know it's something you've had thoughts in the past, but it's not something I've ever heard you talk about for a while. Yeah, you know, I look at, I look at global M2, um, you know, being just under 100 trillion. <laughs> and the total amount of mined gold in world history is uh, somewhere around 7 trillion. And there's about, uh, you know, and, and then gold that's kind of in circulation and use. Um, we studied, you know, we, we did a deep dive on gold a few years ago. And, uh, it, it, you know, they call it the, the yellow metal that has no yield. But um, with, with the entire world going to negative rates, um, then on a relative basis, it's probably one of the better currencies to own. I buy that wholeheartedly. Um, and it, seeing which way the central banks are going, um, you're going to have to own something. And again, you know, gold is a, is a portfolio surrogate currency. Yeah. Um, uh, but you look at, um, uh, you know, owning an apartment building um, where, you know, there are plenty of things one can do um, to have something that acts like gold uh, that won't be confiscated. Uh, but, you know, listen, when you think about negative yields, if, if your expected return, let's say your expected return, I don't know what, what you think an expected real return is going to be going forward. Let's say you think the number's 2%. Um, if you have a negative 50 BIP deposit rate, you're essentially getting a 25% tax yeah. on your future returns, right? It's, it is, is confiscatory. And it's the way that the authorities um, end up getting to uh, hitting your savings. And, and you, you look through history and the interesting, um, the interesting parallels one can draw through history is they're going, right now what they've done is they've made the rich people richer. Any, anyone with assets uh, is now infinitely, uh, not infinitely, is, is more significantly wealthy than they yeah. were going into the financial crisis. And the next thing that happens is um, the backlash that you're seeing with the Bernie Sanders of the world and even, you know, Trump, the populist rhetoric uh, is going to be confiscatory. Um, so I think gold works very well in that scenario for the next few years. So I, I agree with them. It's funny, you, you bring up these luxury apartments and there was, a, there was a period of time where it was a case of, okay, get assets, anything but gold. It, it has to have a return. It has, it has to, to have, have a positive yield. It has to bring you some kind of carry. Yeah. And now here we are, we reach the point we're at in those luxury real estate markets where suddenly people wake up one morning and go, okay, I've had this return for the last few years and I've had the capital appreciation. What I now don't have is any liquidity mm. because I'm long a trophy asset in New York. They're putting up luxury penthouses every day. Yes. 
what the hell do I do now? Oh, that's a good point. And I've so, seen that in Singapore. So I actually wasn't focused on luxury. Right. <laughs> so right, I know right, right. you coming from Singapore and in Hong Kong, I mean, Hong Kong, like 95,000 units coming yeah. this year and absorptions like 15,000 last year, 18,000 last year. Like You're right. On the luxury side, I think things are topped out. But, you know, Bentonville, Arkansas, uh, where, where, you know, Walmart's headquartered, you know, if you have a, a class B apartment building where you have thousand twelve hundred dollar a month rents that is not that that's a necessity yeah um so anyway i wasn't saying luxury but what i'm saying is some yielding asset that you have the that you have some sort of frequency in which you can adjust rents um is something that you can that can maintain net worth for you and in, in the environment we're talking about yeah I but think. i think i think gold now given that that we're seeing negative yields um all over europe all over japan um, all over the world, really, uh, except for the U.S. And I think U.S. yields are going to come down anyway. So, well, let's let's bring it back to the U.S. to finish because it's it seems appropriate. Um, I, I was talking to Mark Yusko recently, and he he said to me, you know, I've, I was chatting to a guy the other day, and when I told him that the stock market had gone nowhere for a year, he just refused to believe me. And of course, it hasn't. The S and P has gone sideways for a year now, maybe fourteen months. Mm. Have we seen the top? Are we now at the point where this earnings recession is starting to factor into people's decision making? Whither the US from this point on, do you think? So I normally give a definitive answer one way or the other. In, the, in, the, in this case, I won't. And here's why. Um, I believe, so when you look at the spreads, when you think, okay, you look at sovereign wealth, you look at the wealth in the world, I think there's um, just, just about $5 trillion worth of cash in sovereign wealth today, it has nowhere to go. And then you think about the endowment model in the US. Um, everyone has to rethink what future expected returns are because they have committed payout level, payout ratios to their, their constituency, whether they're a sovereign or whether they're um, an endowment or, or a pension. Um, I have to start there because the spreads between US 30 year treasuries and 10 year treasuries and Japanese 30 years and 10 years and and European 30 years and 10 years is as wide as it's ever been. And and so what does that mean? That means that I think US rates are coming down regardless of what kind of inflationary pressures we have, which is something that we've never seen before. Yeah. Um, right. Again, a new paradigm given the global central banking conundrum. Um, so when you ask me whether stocks um, have peaked or not in the U.S., it, look, if China has the comeuppance we think they're going to have soon, then that's not going to be an equity positive environment. Um, I think it's fair to uh, say. I'm not calling for a crash, but it's not going to. They're not going to move up during that time frame in the U.S. However, um, if U.S. rates continue to head lower, which I expect, I don't know if they're going to keep re-rating. PEs because people are buying equities as as bond surrogates, um, which is what we've seen. We've yes. just seen PE expansion, right? We just we've we've now we've now collected like ninety five percent of the S and P five hundred earnings, and you have the total total revenue number year over year is down like eight yeah. percent, right? Uh, and profits are down materially year over year in the S and P five hundred, and yet. Um, even if you exclude energy, you have um, the multitude of the sectors are, are lower. Um, and yet, we have a scenario where equities are still flat. So you have PE expansion, you have multiple expansion. Um, if the US 30 year rate goes from a 258 to a 158, and the 10 year goes from 180 to 80, um, will stocks be higher? Maybe. I'm not willing to make the bet, Right. Um, is what I'm telling you. Um, so I don't have a great answer for you. That, that brings us right back to where we started with position size. You know, the, the, the U.S. yield curve is interesting to me because people seem to have an incredibly hard time picturing a world where the U.S. tenure could trade at 80 basis points. Mm. And yet they can look at Bund's negative, they can look at JGB's negative, they can look at the fact that Spain has negative yielding sovereign debt. Yeah. It's, it's like 0.1 trillion. But it's unbelievable. Why do people struggle to, to, to buy U.S. rates expect them to go down sub 1% of the tenure? Well, because they've never done that before. Isn't that amazing though? Right, and, and that new paradigm, even though they see it in, the, in these other countries, you know, very few people have actually bought one of those before. Right. But, in, you know, in those other countries, I don't believe individual investors are buying those bonds. No, I agree. It's only the central banks. 
and people actually front running the central banks, which I believe are professional investors playing a game of picking up a dime in front of a bulldozer. Um, those are the only people buying those bonds. And, and let me get into, uh, people are going to think I'm crazy, but you get into, <laughs> get into this kind of, is there, is there this insidious plan out there? Because if you look at how Japan's executed, you know, their yields are negative out to, I think, 17 years yeah, now. Yeah. Their 30-year bond yields 32 basis points. Think about negative convexity. If you were to buy that bond today, and if it moves 10 basis points higher, if it goes from 32 to 42, right, the duration on that bond's like 29 and a half years, you'd lose 300 basis points in a 10 basis point move. You would lose 10 years of income on what you expected to earn, right? right? The most negatively convex bond in the world. But is there this insidious plan by the Bank of Japan to get their entire yield curve negative? negative. That makes them debt sustainable. Their debts actually shrink if they get their whole curve negative because the BOJ has been able to buy everything, right? And so is that the plan? Well, if you're crazy, so am I, because I've sat there and looked at that chart and thought exactly the same thing. I mean, they, you know, they go out to 40 years, can, and they're at 17 so far. So, so here's the interesting thing about that, right? It, if you're planning on growing, if you, if you need, if, you, if you're looking for 2% inflation and organic growth, um, you have to have an operating financial system. You would think. You would, one would think, yeah. right, that you need the banks to be lending, and you need a, you need a banking sector that works. But if you have the yield curve negative out to 30 years, any liability managers, whether you're a mega bank or a life insurance company, you should just turn out the lights. Right. You're finished. Well, maybe that's, Let's go do something else. Maybe that's how this ends. Maybe someone just turns the lights out and we all go home. Well, if you turn the lights out, you know what happens next, right? So it's like there's no, there's no way to avoid the quote, what happens next. Yeah. It's just they can put it off for such a long period of time. Um, uh, but I think that's in the long run with the sovereign. When you have a banking system like China's, you can't put that off forever. Um, and we can get into why. But going, coming all the way back to the U.S. Um, and U.S. stocks, I'm not sure which way they go uh, other than I don't own any of them. <laughs> right. Right. Uh, and, and, you know, to your point, Stan uh, said the same thing. A, a, there hasn't been a period of time in which I've owned no risk assets in the U.S., but I don't own any. I, I've... I own one company because we, we had just recently stepped off the board and we still own the equity and we like it because it's a, it's a bond surrogate, right? It's in the mortgage insurance business where there are double digit underwriting yields and no legacy losses. Right. That's a good business. I but like this, that. But this is another one of those signposts that people need to pay attention to. If guys like you and guys like Stan are saying, you know what, I just, uh, this is no comment. I just don't feel like owning this stuff right now. I don't think it offers me any value. Right. They're the things that people need to actually just pay attention to and go, okay, there's a reason for this. And I need to understand it. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't put myself in the same category as Stan. I think he's one of the best that's ever lived. And I've been doing this 10 years and, and have a few things right and a few things wrong. Um, but it's exactly how I feel. And, it's, and all of my money is where my mouth is. Yeah. Which, and, is, which um, is important. Which is so important. Yeah. And that, and that whole idea, you know, what made Stan so successful is what we began this conversation talking about. It's that conviction. Because he, he's the guy who said, I sit and I wait and I wait, and when I have my conviction, I swing you for the fences. Yeah. Yeah. And in, and in this case, there's one thing that I am as close to 100% certain of that I've ever been, and you're going to see a loss cycle in the Chinese banks, and the government's going to act in ways that severely depreciate the value of the currency. It's just what has to happen. Well, I can't wait to come back and have that discussion another day, potentially soon, it looks like. Carl, yeah. thank you so much. This has been a real pleasure. It's been a pleasure to have you, Grant. Thank you. Thank you for watching this interview. This is just a taste of what we do at Real Vision. To learn more about the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy, click on the membership link in the description. Give us seven days to change your life. This will be the best dollar you ever invest.